All right, in this video, we'll get back into computing stable stems, and the reference I'm following here is Mosier and Tangora. And we'll only sort of begin the computation that they do there, but um, in any case, we'll see a little bit of how it goes. So let me remind you that we saw in the last video that pi i of s n is finitely generated abelian as long as our space is simply connected, so for n greater than one, and we found that out using SARE classes. And the upshot was that uh, pi i stable is finite. Of course, that's pi n plus i of Sn once we're in the stable range. But um, in any case, this is finite for i greater than zero. Okay, and so I've got some finitely generated abelian group. So maybe it looks like some number of copies of Z. And then there's a torsion piece. So Z mod some prime to some power. And maybe some of these primes repeat. So I'm not saying these are distinct, but various primes to various powers. Okay. But we know that we're looking for something finite, so for the stable stems, we'll just be looking at this torsion piece. And the, the point, really, of learning this is that that tells us that we can compute our stable homotopy groups pi i stable one prime at a time. So if we can find all the two torsion and then all the three torsion and then all the five torsion and so on forever, well, then we'll know the answer. Okay. And of course, at any given spot, there can only be finitely many primes. So uh, that in a sense would tell us the answer though. Of course, that still involves infinitely many primes. Okay, so uh, knowing that we can do this one prime at a time, what we often do is compute the p component. And I think this has come up in discussion at least, but I'm not sure we ever formally defined it. So the key, the, sorry, the p component of A is just the quotient of this A as I've written it here by all the torsion that's relatively prime to p. So we'll just see the free piece and the p powers. So maybe that looks like uh, c to the n, and then now I want these to be actually p, and they've got some exponents. I need a new index. How about L? Okay, great. So uh, what we're going to do ultimately is work with the P component. And we, if we do that one prime at a time, then of course we'll be able to recover what A is altogether. And a key theorem here uh, is that if you had some map between nice spaces, so I'm going to assume they're CW complexes, and let's just go ahead and make them two connected. Ultimately, we're going to be taking high dimensional spheres and things like that, so that'll be no problem. Okay, so I've got some nice spaces, and suppose I know that I look at the induced map on cohomology in mod p coefficients. So p here is a prime, as always. So if this is an isomorphism for all i less than n and a monomorphism for i equal to n, 
then the claim is that I learned something about homotopy as well. So what do I learn? That's supposed to be a comma. So um, what I learned is that I can look at the P component of X and the homotopy of X and the P component of the homotopy of Y and these will be isomorphic. So these are isomorphic P components. And this comes from using SARE classes and like a mod C. Hravich theorem and, and stuff like that. Okay, and this is not necessarily in all dimensions. Of course, I only had an isomorphism for I less than N on cohomology and so also here uh, for I less than N. Okay, great. So, so what's our goal here is we'll work with two components. Our course is coming to an end, so I don't think we'll have a chance to do any P components for odd primes, but of course a lot of the stuff you could you could continue on. Um, so we'll work with two components, and the idea is to compute the cohomology of some nice space X in mod 2 coefficients, and the hope is that if we pick that space nicely enough, then we'll learn about the two component of the homotopy groups of spheres. Okay, and we'll just assume that n is large uh, because we're interested in the stable range. So we won't have any trouble with connectedness. And we'll also see uh, that the Eilenberg McLean spaces will show up in this work. So um, assuming n is large tells us right, that their cohomology um, looks nice for a while. So for example, the cohomology of KZ mon 2n just looks like the Steenrod algebra up through degree 2n. And then we start to see polynomial stuff. Okay, so... Um, I, I won't even write that one down. I think that's pretty familiar, but maybe it's been long enough that let me remind you about, this isn't gonna fit there. Let me remind you about uh, the cohomology of KZN. So I was talking about KZ mod 2N, but if I take KZN, and we'll work in mod two coefficients. In fact, everything uh, in this video will be in mod two coefficients. But remember that this is just polynomial in square i on that fundamental class iota n that lives in degree n. And these i's, these are sequences of squares really, so come on where I runs through, remember we needed admissible sequences. With excess less than n. And if our sequence ends in IR, I1 through IR, then this last thing IR should not be equal to one. And that was just because square one on iota n was zero in this setting. Okay, so we've got iota n in degree n and then nothing in degree n plus one because square one iota n is zero. But then we've got square two iota n which lives in degree n plus two and maybe for now I'll keep writing the coefficients, but pretty soon I'll stop. But we've got KZN here, and then this is also maps to, remember this is representable, so that's KZ mod two 
n plus 2, I guess. It's the degree of our cohomology. Okay, and really maybe I should call this square 2 iota n, but I'm thinking of this as a map over here, and remember our isomorphism here is we take that map and we would take square 2 upper star, really, of iota n. Um, so I'm just naming this square 2 to remind you that this is the thing that, that hits square 2 iota n. Okay, great. Um, so, so we've got this thing, and this is what we're going to use to build a space that will approximate Sn for us in a way, in the sense that um, we can learn about the two component of the homotopy groups of Sn from the cohomology groups of this space. Okay, so how do we get that space? Well, we're going to take this map square 2, again, just thinking of the thing that witnesses square 2 iota n, and that gives us a map, as we just said, from kzn to kz mod 2 n plus 2. Call that square 2. But kz mod 2 n plus 2 fits into a nice vibration sequence, right? Our uh, loop path vibration. And so paths are contractible, and then the fiber here is kz mod 2 n plus 1, because that's loops on kz mod 2 n plus 2. Okay, and I can take the pullback here, and I'll call that x1, since that's what they call it in Mosher and Tangora, just in case you're interested in reading along there, um, or continuing this computation. And remember that when we take the pullback, we get the same fiber uh, up to homotopy. So that's also kz mod 2 n plus 1. Okay, and what we're going to want to do is run our Serre spectral sequence on this fiber sequence, or this vibration. Okay, so we'll do the Serre spectral sequence. Uh, maybe I should say the cohomological Serre spectral sequence, and everything is mod 2. So I'll stop writing um, the coefficients, but what does that give us? Well, let's just draw the very beginning of it. So I've got the cohomology of the base at the bottom, so that's kzn. And I'm dropping off those coefficients, but that's in mod 2 coefficients. And here I've got the cohomology of kz mod 2 n plus 1, that's my fiber, again in mod 2 coefficients. So of course I've got like 1 tensor 1 down here uh, in degree 0, 0, but then in degree n here, I've got iota n. We just said that square one on iota n is zero, so in degree n plus one, that's just zero. But when we get up to degree n plus two, we've got square two iota n. And then I should have all the other admissible sequences. And remember, I should only go up um, to things that are excess less than n, and then I start to see polynomial stuff, but we can make our n as large as we want. So uh, we can just make it large enough that we keep going for a while. So maybe let me just stop for now at n plus 3. Something we've got there is like square 3 iota n. Um, I'm just hesitating because Oh, right, I should also think about square 2 square 1, right? But uh, square 1 iota n is 0, so that thing is just 0. So that, that's something admissible with excess less than n for my large n, but I'm not actually going to write that here. Okay, and then of course this continues on. Now, uh, over on the left here, in degree n, I have nothing. In degree n plus 1, I've got iota n plus 1, and now this is the cohomology of a kz mod 2 n plus 1, really. But So remember, I just see um, the, the whole Steenright algebra. Okay, so the next thing, I do have square 1, and then I've got uh, square 2, and so on. Let me not uh, keep writing it out now, though we'll come back to this. But all of this should converge to 
the cohomology of this space x1 in mod 2 coefficients. And that's really the thing that we're going to be interested in. Now, uh, I claim, and I'll come back and justify this actually in the next video, I suppose, but I think it looks believable here. Um, so what is the claim? I claim that iota n plus 1 transgresses, so tau of iota n plus 1, that, uh, that long differential from edge to edge, is actually square 2 iota n, and that that's really by construction. Okay, so I'll go into the detail of what I mean by that in the next video, as I said, but really I'm just saying this square 2 here is labeled that because it corresponds to square 2 iota n, and that tells me exactly what this transgression should do. Okay, so I think that's believable, but maybe, uh, maybe you know, the, the details are a little hazy right now, so we'll come back and do that. But if we take that uh, on faith for now, then iota n plus 1 comes and hits this square 2 iota n. And then remember that uh, our transgression commutes with the Steenrod squares. So if we believe that, then we look at tau on square 1 iota n plus 1. And that's square 1 of this thing, so square 1, square 2 iota n. And square 1, square 2, remember from an ADEM relation, that's square 3 iota n. So that, that last bit was an ADEM relation. Okay, so that would tell me that this thing comes and hits square 3 iota n. And I could continue on trying to compute what, what the transgression looks like here. Okay, at the very least, that already tells us that since this is converging to the cohomology of x1, well, we've got all the stuff in total degree n. There's only this one class that's left. Okay, so hn of x1 is z mod 2. hn plus 1, well, there's nothing in total degree n plus 1. Remember, we're making n large, so I shouldn't have to worry about polynomial stuff. That'll be in degree 2n. That's got to be huge. Uh, I can make it as big as I want. So um, in degree n plus 1, I've really only got this 0. And oh, the kernel of that map, which, um, or sorry, kernel, yes, the kernel of that tau map, which is 0. OK, so I've got hn plus 1 of x1 is 0. And then again, I look in degree n plus 2, and that was hit. And that supports a differential, so there's nothing there. And so I also don't have to worry about any extension problems. Great, that's also zero. Notice I haven't said anything about hn plus three. We'll, we'll come back and look at that later. But just armed with this little bit of information, oops, gonna need another page here. Sorry about that. Just armed with that little bit of information, uh, I, I actually can say something about the two component of the spheres. Okay, but even that takes a little bit of work to get to. So, so how can we use this? Well, okay, I'm just trying to think how to fit this on the page. I think I'm going to have to go to the next page. So I want to look at this map that started me off that I called square 2. So I went from KZN to KZ mod 2 n plus 2, right? And over on the right, I had my loop path vibration, so that's just paths, which is contractible. And then x1 was the pullback here. OK, so now I want to take a map from Sn to KZN that generates pi n of KZN, which is z. And I claim that square 2 this map after f is null homotopic. OK, well, uh, really, that's just because kz mod 2 n plus 2 is n plus 1 connected. So of course, 
I, the composition here is the map from Sn to that thing, something in pi n, that's got to be zero. Okay, so this is null homotopic, and let's say that H is the null homotopy here. So uh, I, I can think of that as saying that this map factors through this contractible space. Oops, just call that H. Okay, and now because of the universal property of pullback, that tells me that actually I have a map from Sn to X1. So we'll just call that F1. It's basically F, but deformed a little bit. Okay, so I, I wanna remember these facts about cohomology. Basically, what have we done with this? Oops, this one said X2. I was thinking ahead to a later situation. That should be an X1. Um, so, so what have I done with this X1? I've, I've sort of taken something that looks like KZN, I've deformed it a little bit, and in, in doing that, I've killed off the thing that was in degree two, right? Okay, and now I'm looking at the homotopy groups of this thing, I'm looking at maps from Sn to X1. Um, I, I'm really gonna use that to say something about cohomology. So this F1 upper star is a map from the cohomology of x1. Oh, I said I would stop writing the coefficients, but in mod 2 coefficients, to the cohomology of Sn. And this is an isomorphism in degrees less than or equal to n plus 2. So again, I'm in mod two coefficients, so I should just have a Z mod two in degree N here. And then I should have zero in degree N plus one and zero in degree N plus two. And then of course zero in all the higher degrees, but at the very least up to there, that is indeed an isomorphism. And I, I suppose I didn't check the, the lower cohomology, but I think it was sort of clear from this picture that all of that was zero. So. So yes, indeed, we have this isomorphism in these degrees. And now our theorem about uh, having an isomorphism in mod two cohomology tells us about the homotopy groups, or at least their two component. This tells us that pi i of x1 and pi i of sn, these have isomorphic two components Well, uh, really, because I've only got this isomorphism up to degree less than or equal to n plus two, remember I'm supposed to have an isomorphism up to some degree and then a monomorphism in the next degree. So I'm just gonna say that last isomorphism is my monomorphism. And so this is only gonna give me four i less than n plus two. Okay, but that tells me that I have a space that has uh, for its homotopy groups, as long as I only consider the two components, yep, same homotopy groups as Hsn for a little while. Well, I'm interested in stable homotopy groups, so that's not a very long while, but let's at least see what that tells us. So now I wanna look at the long exact sequence in homotopy and see what we get. So that long exact sequence in homotopy looks like I want to look at pi n plus 2 of, oh, sorry. Um, I'm doing the long exact sequence in homotopy for our fibration over here. Okay, so I have x1 to kzn, and then remember the fiber was kz mod 2 n plus 1 because it was loops on this. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm going to go from pi n plus 2 of kzn. to pi n plus one of the fiber, kz mod two n plus one. Okay, that's the interesting spot there, right? And then that maps to pi n plus one of x one, and that maps to pi n plus one of kzn. And of course, this is the long exact sequence, oops, 
not z mod n, comma n. This is a long Zach sequence, so that continues on. Now, of course, I'm still only talking about the two components, um, but, but as it is, I guess I already know that, um, oh, I don't think I even need to be only talking about the two components here because these are things that I know the homotopy groups of, right? This is just zero and this is zero. Um, and so that makes this an isomorphism, but the thing on the left, that's Z mod two. And so that tells me that this is Z mod two. Okay, great. So uh, that tells me actually all of pi n plus one of x1, but what I care about is that that tells me about the two component of pi n plus one of Sn. Okay, so let me just write that part down. Uh, what if we learned? Well, the upshot here is that the two component, notice the two component of just a single z mod two doesn't change it at all. So the two component of pi uh, n plus one of Sn, which is pi one stable, is z mod two. Okay, now if you remember way back when, we actually already knew that pi one stable was z mod two. So we've already proved this, this is z mod two using a slightly different technique, though it looked a little bit similar. Um, so, and this is not just the two component. So we know the whole thing. Okay, so now at this point you're like, great, we just went through all of that work and we learned nothing new. But the point was to set ourselves up for a technique that would easily extend to, to higher things. So in the next video, we'll go beyond pi one stable, we'll actually be able to compute pi two stable, or at the very least the two component using this technique. Okay, but this video is already getting a little bit long, so let me stop there.